What's interesting about Buffett is everyone knows, A, he's a very good investor and he's very wealthy. That's what everyone knows about Warren Buffett. And if you dig into some of the numbers, that's all true, but it's a little bit more nuanced. And really what it is, is Buffett is a good investor, yes, but his secret is that he's been a good investor for 80 years. And the time that he's been investing for, the fact that he's 90 years old today and he's been investing full time since he was 10 is really what makes all the difference in the world. Because I point out in the book that 99% of Warren Buffett's net worth comes after his 50th birthday. It was accumulated after his 50th birthday. And 97% comes after his 65th birthday when he qualified for social security and could have retired. Now, this is so important because if Buffett was like a normal person who retired at age 60, you would have never heard of him. You, he never would have become a household name. He never he would have retired to some beach in Florida to place to play golf with a couple hundred million bucks, as there are like hundreds of those people in Florida. You never would have heard of him. The reason he's so successful is because even after his quote unquote elderly years, that he was wealthy beyond imagination, he kept going and going and going. And it's just the amount of time he's been investing for. And this is so important for investors because so many of us focus and spend so much time and energy trying to answer the question, how did he do it? And, and lots of other investors, how did they do it? How do they invest? How do they think? What are their skills? And we go into grand detail with Buffett about things on moats and how he thinks about business models and all these other you know, really complicated topics, which are great. And you can learn, a, those are important topics. But the, the number one reason he's so successful and so wealthy is because of the amount of time he's been investing for, which I think is, it's almost too simple and basic for people to take seriously. People who work in the industry want to think that it has to be more complicated than that. And it's also kind of disheartening for some people to hear. Some people want to read a book and say, what is the secret that I can learn today that I can start putting to use tomorrow? That's what every, like everyone wants the secret formula. And when you hear that the formula is be patient and wait another half a century, people don't want to hear that. That's a hard thing, but that's maybe that's the point. All great things in life, like the most incredible things, there's a cost to them. There's a cost of admission. It should be really hard. And the fact that being patient for three quarters of a century is really hard is why it's so powerful and pays off so well. So I think that's one of the biggest things we can learn from Buffett. Kind of comes from his biography called The Snowball that uh, is, is really, really fascinating to read this side of him. I think he's so obsessed, and that's the right word, with investing and with business that his entire life he's had more or less a singular focus on valuing and picking companies. And if you read his biography, you can tell that that comes at the expense of his family life, his social life, all these other things. It's really fascinating how many people in the industry admire him. But then when you read about what his whole life is like, like if, if, if you want to be someone, you can't, just, you can't just cherry pick their net worth. You can't just cherry pick their job. You got to think the whole package. And the whole package of Warren Buffett, honestly, doesn't really seem that great to a lot of people, including including myself as someone who really admired him and then read the biography. And I kind of went, I don't know. Look, I, he, it's a fascinating guy. It's a fascinating story. But do I want that life? I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if I do. I think that's, I think he's obsessed with investing and picking companies and allocating capital more than anyone else has been over the last century, probably. I think that's not an exaggeration. Uh, so I think, I think that's, and look, that obsession boils down to and comes down to the fact that when he was in his seventies and he was a multi-billionaire, he said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not slowing down. I'm not going to quit my job. I'm going to keep doing this with as much passion and fervor as I've always had. That's a level of obsession that you don't see in many places. Most, most investors, including myself, I would say, want to get wealthier. Want, they want money. They want to build wealth so that they can maybe go do something else so that they can have a level of independence and go do, fulfill other hobbies, spend more time with their families, et cetera. And I think for Buffett, it was never that. It was, it was never a means to an end. It was always just, he loves playing the game. And the rewards, this is, shows up in his lifestyle as well. The rewards, I think, is, it's just a scorecard to him. Uh, the fact that he lives in the same house he bought when he was 25 years old shows that the wealth that's accumulating is just the scorecard of how he's doing. But I think he loves the game. He loves the process of picking stocks more than the outcome that's made him so wealthy. First of all, the, uh, Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, had, I think, six different editions. Maybe it was five, something like that. And in every different edition that came out, the formulas that he 
showed in the book of here's the formula you can use to pick winning stocks, those formulas changed in every edition. If you look at the Intelligent Investor Edition 1, Edition 2, they have different formulas in there. The reason he updated them is because the old formula stopped working. So he found a new formula that worked and he put it in the book and he said, he's basically saying, this is what works now. So Graham, when he was writing these books, did not intend, I don't think, for these books to be used as a how-to guide, an owner's manual, 90 years in the future. And look, there are, of course, timeless principles in the book. Of course, of course there are. But a lot of what's in the book is hyper-specific to the era in which he was writing in, which is like the 1940s and 50s. This is a long time ago. And when Graham died, which I think was either 1972 or 74, something like that, right before he died in one of his last interviews, he was asked whether picking individual stocks in the way that he laid it out in security analysis and the intelligent investor, who's asked, does that still work? And Graham very clearly said no. And he said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that used to work when we wrote it, but it does not anymore. Or he said, it's unlikely to achieve a level of success like it used to. And this was in the early 1970s. So you can imagine what he might say today if he was still alive. And look, this is not to poo-poo the book at all, because like I said, there are timeless principles in there. But anyone who doesn't accept how the world changes over time and is reading a book that was written in the 30s as rock hard verbatim, this is what you should do today, is going to have a hard time. I think that's one of the reasons why so many people have tried to copy Buffett and so few, if anyone, has been able to emulate his success, even like the, the kind of returns. Because if you look at, if, you, if you're the kind of fanatic who says, okay, Buffett used to pick stocks doing X, Y, and Z using this formula, net nets, you know, you know, net to, di to, to discounted cash flow, like whatever the model it would be. And you're not updating it for how the world exists in 2021. You're going to have a really hard time. And I think this is true for Buffett and Munger as well. That if you look at how they invested in the seventies versus today, it's a lot different, not just because they invest more money today, not just because they have more capital that forces them to invest differently, but just how they see the world is very different. Uh, I mean, what, what one company has Buffett made more money on in dollar terms, not percentage terms, than any other investment he's ever made? Do you know what it is? Yep. Which <laughs> 10 years ago, Buffett would have said, I guarantee you, we, we, you, you and I could find a quote of Buffett saying like, I don't understand Apple. I couldn't do it 10 years ago. And it ended up being in dollar terms, the most money he's ever made ever. So Pete, like even at his age, they're willing to adapt their worldview uh, over time. And I think that's a really critical component. It's, and you know who's actually made a, a better example of this and has a better quote of this is Mike Moritz of Sequoia, who's probably the most successful venture capitalist of all time. He did an interview with Charlie Rose, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago. And Charlie Rose said, look, Sequoia Investments has been the most successful venture capital firm, not just for five or 10 years, but for 40 years. And he said, how do you keep that? Like, like what's your secret? to that kind of consistency and longevity. And Michael Moretz said, we're always scared of going out of business. Only the, paranoid, only the paranoid survive. And what's so interesting about this is that if you run Sequoia Capital and you have that track record, that's like the one person in the world who can look at themselves in the mirror and say, I'm pretty talented. Maybe, like, maybe I do know what I'm doing. And yet that's, that's not what they do. They wake up every morning scared out of their minds. And that's why they've been so successful. And I bring this up because the idea of success being a lousy teacher, as Bill Gates says, is that success tends to give you an idea that you know what you're doing and that you know how the world works. And uh, there's this quote from Jason Zweig where he says, being right is the enemy of staying right because it leads you to believe that you know what you're doing. And once you, get, once you have confidence that you know what you're doing, you start locking on to strategies and worldviews and grasping them really tight. They become part of your identity. And then all of a sudden, you're not able to adapt. You're not willing to adapt. Or if you're a business, you get fat and happy. You get lazy once you're so successful. Rick Guerin is a guy whose name I have seen pop up in books and articles and whatnot through the years as someone who is kind of in the Buffett club going back to the 50s and 60s. He was kind of like one of the original deep value investors from that gang, kind of that Wu-Tang of value investors who came about you know, in the in 50s and 60s. And it actually used to be a trio of Buffett, Munger, and Rick Gurren. The three of them used to kind of be a, a trio making investments. 
And Buffett has talked about when, when Berkshire bought Seize Candy, Rick Gurren went with Buffett and Munger to interview the CEO. Like they were a trio together and everyone knows Buffett and Munger now. But then there's this question of what happened to Rick Gurren. And several years ago, Monish Pabrai, who's a hedge fund manager, won one of the charity lunches with Buffett where he paid like 600 grand to have lunch with Buffett. And he asked Buffett, he said, what happened to Rick Gurren? I know he used to be part of the tribe and then he kind of, you know, he's still around. He's still investing money, but he's, he, he kind of broke off from the Buffett and Munger. He said, what happened to him? And Buffett told him a story that uh, back in the 1970s, Rick Gurren had a bunch of margin debt. He was, I think he owned his Berkshire Hathaway stock on margin. And during the 1970s bear market, he got a margin call. And Buffett said it was actually Buffett himself who purchased the Berkshire stock from Rick Gurren so that Rick Gurren could make his margin call. And the point that Buffett made to Pabrai uh, was he said, Charlie Munger and I always knew we would be rich. He said, it was, there was no doubt in our mind that we would be rich. So because of that, we were not in a hurry. We weren't in a hurry to get rich. We knew it was going to happen. It was inevitable. We just had to play our game and do it. But he said, Rick Gurren was just as smart as Buffett and Munger, but he was in a hurry. He wanted, uh, he, he wanted to get rich faster than, than Buffett and Munger did. And to me, that's fascinating. A, because so much of what we talk about in the industry or what we look for in the industry is intelligence. And when Buffett says Rick was just as smart as he and Munger, uh, he, had, he had the same amount of intelligence, but he didn't have kind of the behavioral instincts, I think that Munger did, of patience. Something so simple and basic. The, the phrase that Buffett uses where he says, Rick was in a hurry is so fascinating and important to me that you can take someone who's just as smart, who just, who's, who just doesn't have the grasp on behavior as well as Buffett and Munger did, and it breaks everything. Now, I, I think Gurin did go on to still become a successful hedge fund manager. I think he, he recovered from his accident, so to speak, but not to the, the degree that Buffett and Munger did. And I think if you were to look at um, the Archegos hedge fund meltdown that just happened a month ago, or what's going on with GameStop and some of the hedge funds that got blown up from that. I think you see the same thing. You find people who are very smart, very intelligent, but they're in a hurry or, or they don't have any, or, you know, any of the dozens of behavioral flaws that are necessary to avoid to become a successful investor. Uh, and this, this is to me is kind of the premise of my book. It's just that good investing is not about what you know. It's not about how smart you are or where you went to school or you know, how sophisticated the Excel model you have is. Good investing is overwhelmingly just about how you behave. It's about your relationship with greed and fear and your ability to take a long-term mindset and who you trust, how gullible you are, those kind of things. And to me, the, the most important part is that behavior is hard to teach. It's almost impossible to teach, even to someone who's very smart. You can teach them calculus and you can teach them uh, data analysis, you can teach them how to read a balance sheet, but you can't teach people how to be patient. It's just some people have it and some people don't. That's, that can be disheartening to hear, but I think it's really true. And all the evidence that we have shows that that is true. That I don't think there's any evidence, unless we're talking about like the marshmallow test at like a really basic level. I don't think there's much evidence that people who are extremely intelligent are also going to be patient investors or the opposite. The people who don't have a lot of training and sophistication they, those people can be patient, very successful investors. And I think it's just very easy to overlook that in this industry, the disconnect between behavior and intelligence. I think virtually every year, there's a story in the news of a very humble person, a janitor, a secretary, whoever it might be, dies and leaves millions of dollars to charity. And no one knew that they had this money. Every year, one of these stories comes about. There's a story about a woman named Grace Groner, uh, I, I use the story in the book of a, a janitor who, 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 who did the same thing. Um, and what's interesting is that, so that happens in investing, that complete novices who come from humble backgrounds do very well. You are never going to hear that story in heart surgery or fixing a root canal that a complete nobody novice janitor performed open heart surgery better than a Harvard trained doctor. Like that would never, ever happen or, you know, built a fully perfect iPhone in their garage. Like there's some things that just a, a, like an amateur novice could never do, but those stories do happen in investing and they happen a lot. I don't think they are really necessarily like crazy uh, one in a million anecdotes. There are 
if, if you look at the vast majority of investment dollars in the United States, the vast majority of dollars are for people who contribute from their 401k. Every other Friday, they put 200 bucks or whatever in their 401k and they invest in an index fund and they never touch it for decades. That's the majority of investment dollars that happens. Most investors to that extent that they're just dollar cost averaging in their 401k are really good investors. What we hear about and what we see and what moves the market are the people who are fiddling with the knobs, the hedge fund managers, the traders, the day traders, the Robin Hood investors, et cetera, that are constantly fiddling. But the vast majority of investors are actually doing great. And the vast majority of investors, even if they don't know it, are outperforming some of the best investors in the world. And that too just doesn't happen in any other field. Like what would it be like if your average golfer, your average just like plays twice a summer, pick, like goes and rents some clubs, was consistently shooting a lower score than Tiger Woods or, or yeah, that's, that's, that's maybe not the best example, but, but the, the best golfer in the world. Like that's what investing is. And I, th I think people don't even know it. They don't even realize it. That the person who has no idea what they're doing, their employer just auto enrolled them in a 401k and they dollar cost average in index funds. They're among like the top quartile of investors and they don't even know it. And there's just no other industry where that exists. And it's a really important part of the story of how we behave. As I think there's a really powerful kind of logical idea that investors are playing the same game, that we're all investing in the stock market. We're often buying the exact same stocks. So therefore we're doing the same thing. And I think nothing could be further from the truth that you have everything from high frequency traders to on one end to pensions and endowments that have century long time horizons on the other. And, to, and, everything, and everything in between. And to think that those investors should agree on what the right price of a stock is, or agree on what news is pertinent, or agree on what the next best move is to do in the market is ridiculous. Like we're all playing completely different games. And what's so important about this is that most investors who don't distinguish one game from another are liable to take their cues from investors who are playing a different game. So the so one example of this is like let's go back to 1999, and uh, Cisco stock or Yahoo stock, whatever it was big back then, is going up 10 percent per day. It's the 1990 stock bubble. W why is that stock going up? Is it because there are long term investors who believe that Cisco was worth 800 billion dollars or whatever? By and large, no. The reason the stock was going up is because day traders thought that it was the stock was going to go up between now and lunchtime, and by and large, they were right. That was the game that they were playing. The day traders didn't care that Cisco's market cap was well in excess of its future discounted cash flows. They didn't, that's not the game they're playing. The game they're playing is the stock currently trades for $70 and I think it's going to 71 before the end of the day. That's their game. But that was really dangerous if you were a long-term individual investor saving for retirement because you saw the stock going up and maybe you thought, hey, maybe these investors know something I don't. Maybe the stock is going up because this is the next wave of the future. And maybe the fact that it's going up says that that's a signal for me that I should be buying more before it keeps going up even more. So the long-term investors start taking their signals, their cues from the day traders. And of course, once the tide goes out, the day traders are gone. They sold, they moved on, they did something else. The bag holders, so to speak, are the long-term investors who took their cues from someone playing a different game. And I think this happens all the time. I mean, if you were to watch CNBC, and you go on and someone, you know, the guy wearing a nice suit uh, says, you should buy Netflix stock. Well, who, who is that advice for? Is that for a 19-year-old day trader? Is that for a 90-year-old widow on a fixed income? Because let's not pretend that those people are the same. So when someone says, you should buy this, like, no, when we all play different games, then you have advice that is good for one person that will be disastrous for another. And I think that, again, it's such an obvious, simple point, but it goes overlooked all the time in a way that I think maybe even the majority of bad investing behavior is caused by people who are taking cues from people who are playing a different game than them. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a long-term index fund investor. So that means that, you know, what happens, like companies' quarterly earnings, even like quarterly GDP, it makes no difference to me. But if I were a momentum fund manager, then that news would be very pertinent to me. So rather, I think there's a big, there's a lot that happens in investing too, where one investor will kind of uh, criticize or minimize how other investors behave. Why is this person 
uh, paying attention to short-term data. Why is this person so oblivious to a stock that's going down and they keep hold it even though the trend lines are going down? And a lot of our arguments in this industry are not necessarily people disagreeing with each other. It's people who are kind of upset that they realize uh, that other people are playing a different game. And I, I think it's a cause of a lot of bad behavior. And the best things that's so critical for any investor to do is just define the game that they're playing and make sure that the information and the cues that they take that are going to dictate their behavior are only relevant to your personal game. This concept of enough, that no matter what we're doing, and this applies to a lot of things in life, you have to have at least some boundary of saying like, that's enough. And once I get to this point, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reach this high. Like that, that's just enough. Maybe it's possible to get more, but it's enough. I think it's a really critical investing skill. And for me, what it's been is just this observation that, look, if I can dollar cost average into index funds for the next 50 years, I'm going to achieve every financial goal that I have. And then some, I'll be able to take care of my family in this life. I'll be able to leave some to my heirs. I'll be able to leave some money for the betterment of society. I'll be able to travel everywhere I want to go, live in the house I want. Like every financial goal will be met if I can do that. So why, if, I, if, I, if I'm currently doing that, why would I want to reach for more? If reaching for more is going to add more risk, that everything's going to blow up in my face, it's going to be more complicated, it's going to take more work, et cetera. Like if, if, if I can already get everything that I want, why would I push even harder? It, like, what said, what, what, what's the logic in that? If I'm already getting everything that I want, uh, so that's that's kind of how I, I look at it. That if I can do this simple investing strategy, that is doesn't take really any mental bandwidth, and I can achieve all my goals. Like, that's it. Now that works for me, and that works for my goals, my wife's goals. But it might not work for other people. Other people might have a little bit more of a Type A personality than I do. Uh, so, so their goals are different, but I think knowing what is enough and staying within that boundary, wherever your boundaries are, just making sure you're staying within them is so critical for investors. The other thing for me, for my investing strategy is I'm a passive investor, but I'm not a passive zealot. I'm not one of the people who says you can't beat the stock market. No one can do it. It's a waste of time. It's all marketing. I'm not, I'm not that person at all. And I know investors and fund managers who I have a, a good degree of confidence will outperform the market this year, or next year, over the next five years. So then the question is, why don't I invest with those people? If I, if I'm, if if I'm honest, I, I I think they will earn returns above the index. And the reason I don't is because I think the more complicated that I make my personal investments, the higher the odds that I'm not going to be able to, to sustain it over time. If I were to invest in one of these fund managers, maybe I'll do very well over the next year or five years. But is that a manager that I can stick with for 50 years? Am I get to am I going to get to a point where I don't believe that they are, have their skills anymore? That I'm going to have to question them? That I'm going to have to pull out? Maybe I pull out at the worst possible time. The more knobs I have to fiddle with, the higher the odds that I'm going to interrupt my investing process at some point. Versus, I think if my investment strategy is very simple, there's like no knobs to fiddle with. It's just the Vanguard total stock market, and it's just it's just so brainless. That's it. I think that gives me a higher chance of sticking with it for 50 years. And if I can stick with something for 50 years, compounding is going to go nuts. That's all it is. Like all investing is just money and time. And the time is the most important part of that equation. So all I want to focus on is maximizing time. It's not maximizing annual returns. It's maximizing how can I stay here for 50 years? And I'm going to be able to do that with as much simplicity as I can. And I, maybe it works for me too. I've, I, I have almost no susceptibility to FOMO. It just doesn't really bother me that much. Uh, it, like, it's, I, and that's not true in other parts of life. I think in other parts of life, I, I see people doing something and I'm like, ah, I, I really want that. But for investing, it's just not, it's not there. I'm totally okay earning uh, the returns of the Vanguard total stock market index when I could have been all in Fane stocks or all in Bitcoin or whatever it might be. That, that really doesn't bother me because I'm just so attached to this idea that if I can do this for 50 years, I'm going to achieve everything that I want to do. Like in most fields, the harder you try, the better you do. Like if you want to become the best golfer in the world, well, go to the range for 12 hours a day and hit a thousand golf balls. If you want to be the best basketball player, go live in the court and practice all day long. Most, if you want to be a doctor, go study in med school for a dozen years. Most fields, there's a very strong correlation between effort and outcome. And investing is just not one of those fields. It's one of the counterintuitive fields where the harder you try, the worse you're likely to do. That's usually the case. 
And therefore, if you have a passive strategy, I think it just kind of tickles people to say like intuitively that doesn't feel right. It doesn't, it feels like, of course, you should be able to do better if you, if you try harder. Like imagine if you wanted to become a good golfer and the strategy was like, oh, never practice, never hit a ball, never think about it, never read the golf news. Like that, that, that doesn't make any sense, but that is the right investing strategy for a lot of people. So I think it's just one of the few fields where it doesn't necessarily work. And then the other answer that's a little bit cynical, but I think there's truth to it, is that um, if you're a financial advisor or a fund manager, you can't ch charge a fee for telling people, go in an index fund. And by the way, the only company that's been able to really make it work is Vanguard, which is a nonprofit. That's why, they, that's why it's worked, is because they don't need to make a profit by selling people all the, a lot of the BS that exists out there. So the fact that Vanguard only works because it's a nonprofit, it to me is like all you need to know about why, why other firms push back against it. You can't make any profit doing it. <laughs> so I think that that's a cynical answer, but I think there's, there's quite a bit of truth to it. From what I understand and the cursory knowledge that I have about this topic, a lot of the fundamentally weighted indexes have very good back tests and not that great actual results, which is, that's like, that move, that story has been told a thousand times in investing for every different kind of investing strategy. I, I'm pretty sure that's the case for a lot of them. The back tests are beautiful, but the, but the return, the actual returns, even if you're looking over a 10 plus year period are okay at best. And maybe that's because a lot of them are value tilted and value just hasn't worked over the last decade for various reasons. Maybe it will in the future, but it hasn't over the last decade. Maybe that's some of the reason, but it, it you know, one thing about fundamentally weighted indexes is that uh, or, or equal weighted index is that it's not just uh, it's not just a stock market that heavily we weights towards winners. Capitalism heavily weights towards the winners, and so it doesn't. You know, it it it, it in, when capitalism is kind of a winner take all field in most industries, it would make sense that you want to have the most weight to the biggest, most successful companies. That makes that that makes a lot of sense. Now, is there also logic that the biggest companies tend to be the most overvalued? In the 1990s, it was Dell and GE, and maybe today it's the FANG stocks that are the most overvalued, the most likely to underperform in the future. I think there's a lot of logic to that as well. But to me personally, it kind of falls in the bucket with fiddling around the edges in a way that might work and might not. And when I weigh those out together, I say, I'm fine. I'm fine owning cap-weighted stocks. Uh, I, I accept that there's going to be periods, even fairly long periods, when cap weighted doesn't work as well as other things could have. But again, if I'm thinking about just sticking with something for 50 years, that's totally fine with me. I finished writing the book in January of 2020, so pre-COVID more or less. Um, but it, it's true that in March of, how, how you behaved in March of 2020, when the world was falling apart, will have more impact on your investment and returns than all of your behavior in the previous decade combined. I think that's probably right. And that's usually true. Like if you were to look at your 20 year results as investors, the most important things that would matter is how did you behave during the dot-com bust? How did you behave in 2008? And how did you behave in March of 2020? Those three little punctuated moments matter more than everything else combined. And if you are one of the investors who panicked last March and sold everything in March of 2020, that's a scar on your net worth that will be with you for the rest of your life. You'll never be able to recover from that. Uh, and so that's that's usually what it works. There's a, there's a quote, like a long, a, 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 an old joke about pilots, that a pilot's job is hours and hours of boredom, of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror, which is where I got that quote. It's the same in investing. Like how you, like what really matters is just how you respond 1% of the time. 99% of investing is really boring. And, but what you do 1% of the time will change your life whether that's not panicking during a crisis, whether it's buying more in a crisis, whether it's not getting caught up in the final moments of a, of, of a massive bubble, like how you respond a fraction of the time is going to account for the majority of your returns over time.